quería hablar en uh, castellano, pero los jefes uh, no tienen confianza en mi castellano. ¿sí? <risa> Un poco triste porque he estado estudiando y practicando, pero próxima vez, próxima vez. ¿sí? Okay. So, uh, the do's and don'ts for fundraising is the name of this talk, and I want it to be a, a practical talk about fundraising. And before I get into it, there's one important qualifier, and that is I'm talking about now venture capital fundraising in uh, the United States and in Europe. Uh, so I think when you are raising money uh, in other places, there are some different rules that might apply, and so I don't want to overgeneralize. This is really for, uh, and certainly if you're raising money from angels and from well-to-do individuals, many of these rules don't apply, so this is a specific talk about uh, venture capital funding as I understand it. So. Uh -huh. Number one, don't. Don't be boring, okay? It's the most important thing, and people forget this all the time. They start out, and let me give you an example of, of how I see a lot of uh, startup pitches start, like this. Uh, this is my name, this is what I do, this is where I was born, I have a wife, I have two kids. Fast facts about my company. We were started on this day, we have 27 employees, our office is in, no one cares, okay? No one cares, and remember that the person who you're talking to probably has five of these meetings on the same day. And they're going to hear the same thing again and again. So you want something a little more interesting, okay? And so I use this one, it doesn't really, and I use this as an example just to get a laugh for you guys, but the reality is you want to start off with something that's, that's interesting and gets them moving forward, gets them interested in this conversation. Uh, and just remember, uh, this talk is not as much, a, a fundraising pitch is not about you, it's about them. You are selling to them. You need them to say yes. It's not about, uh, oh, I've now told them my entire life story. Do your research. That's a, um, so we have do's and don'ts, uh, Ariel. So we have do's and don'ts. Uh, do your research. Know who you're talking to. Um, most venture capitalists have published a lot of things about how they think about investing. Uh, a great example is Jeff Clavier has what he calls the three ass rule. Uh, it's very polite. He's French, so you have to excuse him. Um, but uh, it's, it's, you, you can, and if you read this rule, you will know what it is he's looking for in a company. You should know what these people invest in, what are the themes that they're investing in. Of course, you cannot have a new pitch for every investor you talk to. It's impossible. You prepare your pitch, you need to deliver it in a certain way. But if you are delivering a, a, a fundraising pitch, you should understand what are the key drivers, what are the investment themes these people care about, and all of this information is readily available uh, on the internet. So uh, it's, it's really important that you do your research. Another thing I'd, I'd say on this point is to think about the venture capital math, right? And I've heard it described this way. Uh, a, a, a good venture capitalist will get 1,000 introductions uh, per year, 1,000. Okay? Of those 1,000, they're going to take 300 meetings. Of those 300 meetings, they're going to make 100 second meetings. Of those 100 second meetings, they're going to go further. They'll go into real diligence in 10 companies and make five to six offers a year. So these are the numbers that you're sort of running up against. You need this person to fall in love with you and your story uh, to be successful. And so to do that, you should understand what are the things that they actually care about do run a process. Um, I oftentimes find companies, they say, well, I met this guy and he's interested in, in funding the company and so I started talking to him and then I know another guy but I'm meeting him three weeks later and you know, sort of doing things one bit at a time. An organized process, and, and I chose this slide for a reason, which is I think what you want to try to do is line up all of the possibilities, all of the people you think you want to talk to and start them all at once, okay? I'm going to be a little bit more tactical and more specific. Um, I think you can only manage uh, six to eight conversations at one time. It's too much to try to manage 15 to 20, because if you send out 20 introductions, people have meetings, you want to be, it's difficult to schedule and balance all the scheduling needs and balance your research. My advice, very specific, very tactical, is make a list of 20, Pick the six that you want to start with. Start with those six or eight. Uh, and as soon as one drops out, fill another one in, 
right? So you always have six to eight in the pipeline moving through it at all stages. Um, it's, uh, um, yeah, I think, I think without this process, without a process, you can find yourself in a pretty, in a pretty tricky position. Also, I will tell you that in the, the venture capitalists gossip like they're, like they're high school girls. Uh, I, I mean, it's unbelievable. So if you've been out fundraising for six to eight weeks, everyone sort of knows. And there's a notion that, well, this company has been shopped around and it's not that interesting anymore. And that's a very dangerous thing that you can run into. So you want to try to compress the time that you're out fundraising. Oh, uh, sorry, one other thought. When you start with your list of six to eight, don't go to all the best firms only. I think you have to look at, okay, I'm gonna to go to six to eight firms, let's say it's eight. I'm gonna pick you know, three of the really top tier firms, three of the kind of second tier firms, and then maybe two smaller firms. You just don't know, it's such, as, as I described earlier, it's such a math game, you don't know who's gonna be interested in your, in your company. Trying only the best firms makes it just that much less likely, and you just don't want that much time to go on while you're funding. Don't ask for too much money. I think this is one that, that gets screwed up all the time, so I'm gonna talk about it. It's very easy to increase the amount of money that you're asking for. If you, if you say, well, I'm looking to raise $2 million, and someone says, great, you can come back to them and say, well, I, I'm actually now I have so much demand, I'm gonna raise $3 million. Um, the opposite is not true. If you tell someone, I want $10 million, and they say, no, thank you, you cannot come back in and say, knock, knock, just kidding about the $10 million. I, I only really need five. Because you've just told them I need 10. And this is actually a little bit illogical. I mean, just, you know, if, if robots were making these decisions, maybe there would be different decisions. But people are making decisions. And so it's very easy to walk people up. Um, it's very, it's, it's impossible to get them down. So don't ask for too much money. Do tell a story. Uh, this is something I find uh, that, that people don't do a good job in terms of harmonizing the, the, the kind of fundamentals about the company. I, I call this the book report problem. And what I mean by that is people come in and say, well, this is what happened. I, I used to do this, and then I did this, and now I'm thinking about this, and they're talking about themselves, or they're just talking, and the company, and this is what it does, and then I met this guy, and that's not really that, that's not a compelling story. You want a story like Star Wars, okay? And the reason, I mean, Star Wars is a perfectly good, <laughs> good story. You want, you need good guys and bad guys and like tension, some creative tension, what's gonna happen at the end. I mean, you wanna actually make, in your pitch, you wanna make this an interesting, interesting pitch. And I've shown, you know, I showed the Superman picture, which was kind of silly, and I'm talking about Star Wars. It doesn't have to be, I don't wanna imply that this has to be some kind of um, showy thing. The, the, the Star Wars element could be, when I was in graduate school, I solved a really hard math problem, and no one else really understands this problem, but this problem is actually gonna be the key to cybersecurity in the next five years. Like, oh, okay, now I wanna know more. Tell me more about that. Yeah, then, and, you know, and then you could say, and all these other companies are doing it this way, but I actually know that that's never gonna work, and here's how you can get around it. I mean, it's just, it's a story. Uh, that's the type of story that's gonna get, that, that gets investors excited. It's something that's coherent. And again, remember, they're listening to all these different pitches and they want a narrative, a story that they can believe in. So do tell a story when you're, when you're doing fundraising. Uh, this one I see broken all the time. Don't say you have no competition. I, I, have, I hear people say this all the time. We're the only ones doing this. Well, who's your competition? We don't have any. Like, wrong, you do, you have lots of it. And, what it really shows is you don't understand what the word means, and you're going to lose a lot of credibility. There are incumbent companies that you're trying to disrupt. There are potential competitors that can get into this space. There are companies in adjacent spaces that will likely get into this space. If you're in an interesting market, you're going to have competition, and that's okay. Of course you have competition. All the best companies did and do today. Uh, good markets have uh, other market participants in there. Uh, so saying, well, we're the only ones in this space and no one else will ever be there, it's not believable and it actually is a bad indicator. Uh, if there's money to be made, lots of people are going to go to it. Uh, so no competition is uh, a, a big don't. Embrace your warts. This is a complicated one. Um, 
There are lots of bad things about any startup company, lots of weaknesses, every company has them. And you have sort of two choices. You can pretend that they don't exist, or you can be really open about them and talk about them. And I really believe that you want to be like, like Beast, and Beauty and the Beast, and, and say, look, this is who I am. This is what I am. Uh, example. Um, if you have a new consumer internet company, a new consumer internet product, distribution will be a problem for you. Distribution is, is a core problem in any consumer internet business. <clears throat> you know this. Talk about it. You know, in fact, the best thing you can say is, the best possible thing in a pitch is while you're going through the pitch saying, distribution is our biggest problem. Here's what we're going to do about it. One, two, three, four. We have 25 other ideas, but these are our top three, okay? And because what it shows is you've actually thought this business through. What a venture capitalist wants to see is that you have, you've been really thinking hard about this problem, you understand it, and you've, and you've given some thought to, uh, to how you're gonna tackle it. Um, it's perfectly okay that there are unknown issues. You don't have to have solved all of the problems. And, and saying you've solved them all won't be believable. But saying you understand what the problems are, you have a plan to address them, and, uh, and, and you, at least you know what you're going to try, or start by trying, is something that I think you want to do. Don't try to fit everything into the deck. <laughs> um, it's a story. Uh, and I find that people come in with 40 slides and then they put up one slide and they say, well, I'm not going to talk about this slide, but let me just briefly say, well, why is the slide up there? I, there's, you can only have so much information that you want to talk about and you don't know what the other person is going to, remember, it's a two-sided conversation. So you don't know what the person on the other side of the table wants to talk about. He or she is going to have a lot of questions. You want to be ready to answer those questions. It's great if, you, if the question is, well, how, what are you going to do about distribution? Oh, well, I, I didn't put it in the deck, but I, uh, I have in this appendix, or I have a slide on that that I didn't put in the deck. Uh, I can send it to you afterwards, but let me talk you through it. One, two, three, four. And that's a great answer. It doesn't mean it has to be in the deck. You can't anticipate. It's impossible to anticipate all the questions you're going to get. It's impossible to solve for it. And you don't want to have a deck. And the worst thing you could do is have a deck that's too long, you can't get through, and you only get through half of it. Uh, because there's people run out of time or get bored, even worse. Don't name drop. This is a really deadly one. Um, well, I was talking with John Doerr the other day, and like, <laughs> no one cares. First of all, no one cares, right? I know it doesn't matter. And, and secondly, it actually makes it seem like you're pretending to be something that you may or may not be. Um, and the guy you're sitting with probably was talking to John Doerr yesterday. And so it's, it's, not, that, it's not that useful. Um, so don't do that. Uh, and in related comment, don't talk about your advisors. You know, you have the king as your advisor. You know, you have this professor. I, I find this a lot of people. You look. If, I, if if you ask me right now, should I ever have advisors on my slides? I would say no, as a general rule, no. From time to time, of course, really good advisors lend credibility to a business, particularly if it's very young. Uh, but in general, you know, the princes and kings are not going to help you run your business. You are selling yourself and the company that you put on and, and the team that you put on the field. Um, and whether or not someone else is advising you, it's really not that important. It's a little bit of signaling. Uh, but if you ask me, now should I have my advisors, I say no. I, I in general say no. You know, if you're solving a really hard problem, let's say in physics and, and you have a, a, a great physicist or a healthcare issue you have Nobel Prize winners, helpful. But if you have 17 Nobel Prize winners signed up, it's, you know, question. Really know your numbers. I mean, this, I, this one I can't say enough of. And there's actually a great blog post now from uh, my friends at Andreessen Horowitz about, how, about what the numbers should be. It literally came out in the last week. Um, 16, I think there's some, 10 numbers you should know, I don't remember what it is, but it's seven, it's, it's seven numbers? Yeah. Okay, so it makes it easier. Uh, you really need to know these numbers, and you need to know them in and out. So not just know what your numbers are, but understand what are the drivers behind the numbers. In other words, you know, oh, uh, my conversion rate is X, but yeah, if I spend, if when I have paid conversion, it's Y. If I spend more, it start, this is where it starts to decrease. Really understanding the interplay between what your numbers are today, what they can be, how do you get from here, how do you drive that bridge from here to there, what are the big drivers? They're gonna ask questions just to test to see how well you know your numbers. 
Um, and if you, oh, I need to get back to you, it, it's okay. I mean, you, you may not know every answer, but it would be really good if you had a, a, a firm grasp of your core metrics and would understand even how changing them one way or another impact, it, you know, how changing certain variables impacts the other metrics. Really um, deep understanding of the numbers is important. Oh, sorry. The big three. I, uh, I put Manu Ginobili here because I figured it would. <laughs> uh, but there are three big things. So, so this pitch can be broken. In, you know, you think about a, a pitch to a venture capital firm, and there are lots of different aspects to it. In my view, it's really three things. It's the total addressable market. It's the product market fit. How is your product going to fit into that market? And then the team that's going to execute on the plan. Those three things are the most important. And they're really the core of every venture capital investment. And let's go through all of them because I think it's tricky. Um, first is total addressable market. This is one that is very hard to nail down, but, but can, can be confusing uh, because a lot of people express it in terms of overall spend. In fact, uh, Gonzalo and I were talking about, well, how, much, how, many, how many dollars have you been the lawyer for fundraising? And it's, I know, it's a big number. But it's sort of thinking, it's sort of an irrelevant number, right? It, it doesn't, that doesn't mean that my business is a $30 billion business. No, it just, it's irrelevant, right? It's like cash registers at Walmart have rung up $3 trillion of business this year. Therefore, I'm going to disrupt the cash register at business, right? No, no, I mean, it doesn't, those two things are not always aligned. I see this a lot in ad tech, you know? It's like $600 billion of media was spent last year, and we're going to disrupt this market. Well. Okay, but how much of it was spent to, for technology that supports advertising, right? That's really what you care about. Um, product market fit. Obviously, if you're an early stage company, this is difficult. It's a difficult thing to establish, but I remember this. Venture capitalists um, uh, aren't paid to predict the future. They're paid to look at the present and understand what it means about the future, okay? And what that means is you have little data, you have some data, and you can take that data to say, look, you know, we have, with no paid advertising, this is, the convert, this is, this is the, the, our user growth. Imagine if we just started paying people to get them in the top of the funnel. Or our conversion rate, once someone lands on our, this page, our conversion rate is, is X percent. So all we need to do is get more people to the page, and that's actually, we know how to do that. You can, there's a way to do that by spending money. Or we have seven paying customers in the enterprise with uh, one salesperson who's been doing all the sales by him or herself. Okay? So if we can get five salespeople, we could really, uh, and, and we have 300 leads in our pipeline that we can't look at because we don't only have one salesperson. So if we can pay, if we can hire four more salespeople to call on these accounts, and this is the type of example of how you're going to say, look, we have product market fit. Somewhat the, there is demand for what we're building, and we, but we need more money to, uh, to fulfill that demand. So that's, uh, that's product market fit. And then team. And you really have to talk about um, what the team has done in the past and how it relates to, I, I think, execution. I think that's really the critical thing. Um, you know, and, and sometimes you don't have that much information, but whatever you can, can grab onto uh, is, is critical. Uh, let's see. Big three. Final note, yeah, is, is passion, okay? And um, I think this is really critical. Uh, you know, the, a pitch to a venture capitalist, uh, in the end, it, it's, it's, it's a quantitative thing. It's, a, it's an intellectual exercise because you're explaining to them, you're, you're winning an argument. But part of what you're also doing is convincing them that you, you are excited about this business and that you can get other people excited about the business. And you have to have some real passion and enthusiasm for that business. And let me say this, that does not mean that you need to be an extrovert, okay? It does not mean you have to have an excitable personality. Some of the coldest people in the world display a lot of passion, but they display it in a different way. And so it can be, uh, I use the little math example. It could be, I solved this math problem a long time ago. I am the best person in the world at this, and I spend all my time thinking about it. Like, oh, okay, that sounds like someone who I might want to invest in, you know? Uh, so it doesn't have to be, and a lot of my examples are a little bit um, comedic. They're a little bit uh, schlocky is the word I use in English. I don't know. That's a word I don't know in Spanish. But um, they're, 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 
but they're, they're out, they're loud. But you can, be, you can have quiet intensity. It doesn't need to be a, uh, a, a loud thing to express that you have real, uh, real passion for the business. Uh, and it's gonna come off. It's really gonna come off in the room because what the person writing the check wants to know is that this person, the person who, if they write a check that this person's going to work every day and think about nothing but this, this important thing um, for the next five years, right? I mean, we, that's, that's the time horizon. And so you have to figure out a way to convey that um, in your message. So uh, that's my final do. Uh, so that's, that's what I have from a prepared perspective, uh, but I want to take whatever questions that you guys have, please. As long as they're in uh, English. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for for, for having. Uh, they can say that I, I will have the first questions and then we, we will open to to anyone. He always has the hardest question. Yeah. Um, well, I I want to first say thank you for 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 take the time to prepare this presentation for us. Um, the the first question that I have is related to the moment that we are living in the last week. Yeah. I think that the world was growing for the last six, seven years, and right now uh, it's coming the rough time. What, are, what is your take for, for an entrepreneur that is raising money in that moment? And what are the tips and do's and don'ts uh, regarding yeah. the, this particular moment? Yeah, I think this is a, a great time for startup companies. The best companies I've been involved with have, been, have, have raised significant rounds during this down period. Uh, Facebook uh, raised an enormous round uh, in 2008. I was involved in that transaction. Dropbox uh, did, uh, it was a very interesting. Sequoia, uh, it was a famous thing that happened in Silicon Valley that in 2008, after Lehman Brothers uh, and the credit meltdown occurred, um, Sequoia Capital, one of the leading venture funds, had, had something they called um, the end of good times, RIP good times. And uh, they said, oh, they, they had all their companies come in and say, oh, look, the world's going to be tough, and that, don't spend money, be careful, don't run out of money. And that week, they funded Dropbox at a, at a really high price. Uh, so good companies can raise money. I, I actually think um, frothy growth is bad for startups because this will reduce the cost of talent. The co I mean, what, are the, what are the two real drivers of startup cost? Real estate and, and, and people. Right? Yeah. Those are the, that's what you guys have to pay for. So when you have frothy markets, those two things really go up. And when they go down, to, I think it's net, net good. Uh, and I think venture capitalists are, are going to invest. I mean, they, they have the money. They need, they need to put it to work. They can't get paid if it sits on the sideline. Uh, regarding the perspective of a, a Latin American company trying to raise in money in, in Silicon Valley, what are, you are competing with a bigger guys than, than here. Yeah, yeah. It's, I think that's a very, very difficult. Uh, I think it's a very difficult thing to do. My view about it is that um, you want to look like an American company as much as you can, and it's not just oh, we have a Delaware corporation. No one actually cares about that. It's you want to say, well, I'm sorry, people care, but it's not that important. Uh, you want to say uh, we have our we have headquarters here. We have these people here. You know, and because remember. Uh, or we are attacking this market, we're attacking the US market, unless you're truly a dominant Latin American player, it's gonna be very hard to get, I think, a US venture capital firm to, to support you. Uh, because, frankly, they don't understand um, the, the economy here. I, I don't understand the economy here, but maybe, don't no, worry. maybe, no, maybe nobody understands the economy. We need it. But, I know, but you, as you can imagine, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to, for, so, so, and it would be irresponsible, really, for uh, uh, for U.S. investors to, to, to do that. And, and maybe they made some irresponsible decisions in the past. Um, last question from my side. And then, um, regarding this uh, rough perfecting that, that is coming, uh, do you recommend that a company focus on to get um, the break-even sooner than any moment or increase the... The, yeah. the, the growth, the growth rate. Right. Yeah, the answer is there's no safe answer. Uh, and so you have to choose between one of two paths, both of which have risk. If you slow your growth down, you're much less likely to run out of money, which is good, right? 
but it becomes much more difficult to raise first tier venture capital, okay? If you increase your, if you, if you spend and increase your burn and start to grow, you have a chance to raise venture capital, but if you miss, you're going to run out of money and die. And so there, I wish I could say, well, there's an easy answer. There isn't. It, it, in a way, it's a lot like ski. I think it's a lot like skiing. You know, at some point when you learn to ski, you need to point your skis down the hill and go. And you know, a, a, a ridge comes and you don't know what's on the other side of the ridge, but you're going. You're gonna just keep going, and you'll deal with it when you get there. And it's. And I, I, it's not an easy decision, and it's, it's, it's easy for me to, to, to give this advice because I don't have to. I, and I'm not going to smash into someone. Um, but it's a very, it's a very difficult decision. But understand that there is no safety in slowing down. If you slow down your growth, you're going to disqualify yourself from raising a certain type of capital, and then maybe the market's going to pass you by, or your competitors are going to pass you by. Fantastic response. Uh, first question. Come on, guys. Hi. Hello. I speak English too. Excellent. So. Excellent. <clears throat> One thing you didn't comment on do's and don'ts, and I'd like to hear your point of view, is the use of advisors. Yes. Accountants, lawyers, yes. fundraisers, investment bankers, yes. and consultants of all kinds, especially for folks here in Argentina. I know my point of view in the United States, but I think it would be helpful for folks here to understand who to use meaning what nationality of folks to use, when to use them, and the do's and don'ts of them. Yeah, wow, I mean, I could give a whole talk on that. I mean, it's a long, in, in general, um, when you're raising venture capital, um, anyone between you and the money is, is not appropriate, is, in my view. In other words, what you, you, bankers, uh, consultants, people who, who facilitate introductions, rarely are adding value. I mean, unless we're talking about, well, I, I, I'm raising $400 million and I want access to T. Rowe Price, uh, you know. So in general, if you're a startup, anyone who, said, anyone who says they can put you in touch with people I, but want to get paid for that, I would be very skeptical about those. Um, you want to work with, uh, with respect to um, lawyers, accountants. lawyers and accountants. I, I think accountants are, are actually not that important at the very beginning. Uh, it, it really... The, the, the metrics that really drive start, uh, startup investment tend to be uh, business product metrics, not financial metrics. Uh, those, you know, the, the financial metrics tend to be trailing indicators. So unless you're a relatively mature company, you're not going to need audits. And so it, it, you know, people, they, they care about cash. Uh, cash and, 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 and then what, whatever the relevant product metrics are. So accounting is not that important. Um, with lawyers, um, here, I've, I've, found, I've found some people who are pretty good uh, here in this country. Uh, so uh, I think you want to eventually affiliate with a top, a top tier law firm because I think there's a certain brand of quality that comes with that. You just don't want to ha have that be a risk factor. So probably your, 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 your dad's cousin in Miami is not the right lawyer for you. Um, but uh, I think it's okay when you're getting started to use someone local, but when you're ready to get to the US, you should have someone who you trust on your team. What about uh, marketers? Latin America, uh, wanting to raise money in the US, you are saying they need to become relevant. Yeah. And to what point uh, does the previous experience in Latin America or, uh, become relevant, or how strong does that foothold in the US market need to be to become interesting for BC, uh, US VCs in a way. Yeah, I, I would go back to the, the point I made about how, do you, how can a venture capitalist tell that there's product market fit? So if you have, if, if you said, well, gee, we're a security software company and 27 of the biggest, 30 biggest companies in Latin America are using us and we have five US customers, I think that's plenty, okay? If you say, well, uh, three Latin American companies are using us and we're, we're just opening our US office, I think that's very different. I think that what you need to show is traction. I mean, and this is what the investors, the, the best investors are going to invest in early signs of this thing is going to be good. Uh, and, and what are, you have to be able to get them those right, the, the right signal. In enterprise, it's this, in, in consumer, I think it's, a, a different issue altogether. I think you have to show actual user growth in the U.S. Um, it, you know, I think having one person pitch is really dangerous because, and having one founder teams are, is also very dangerous. I, most 
many, many, many good companies start with a group um, because you want to you want to show like it's not just a one person sitting alone, and it and, and you and you have to convince that all of these three people are going to help the company get to a certain point. Most likely, they will not take the company all the way, and I think that's a you know something that we have to all kind of accept. It's in my experience, it's very rare to see a founding team of three that ends up with the company five years later, uh, but that's okay. Um, some people are, uh, you know, some people are excellent teachers and are great teachers for primary school, but you wouldn't make those people college teachers necessarily. And it's just a different thing that you're trying to do. So, and, and frankly, we're evaluating when you show up with that, those first three people, what the, the, what the investors are evaluating is, can these three guys build up the company to something? Once it's something, then other people typically need to come in. Thank you. The very last question. Okay. Hi. Uh, could you please recommend us which are the VC films of the top five VC films for early stage or seed rounds? Um, well, I, um, look, I, I, it's hard to say that there are, are well, two, I say two things. First of all, I think it's pretty, there's a lot of good information that's published about the top firms. I don't think it's, uh, uh, my opinion about them is, is, uh, isn't necessarily, uh, uh, right or wrong. I mean, I think we you know who they are and you can find them. I would also say there's no exactly who's number one. And I, I'll give you an example. My, my favorite firm, the firm I like to work with the most, and if I were doing, starting a company, the firm that I'd want to fund my company is Sequoia, Sequoia Capital. I, I've spent a lot of time with them. I really like them. My brother would never take their money in a million years. Why? Because Sequoia has a culture of did you do the thing you said you're going to do? No, you're an idiot. What's wrong with you? You know, and, and it's it's a very aggressive culture. When I was a student, the, my favorite teachers were the teachers who was like, "This work, junk. Do it again." And like that that was very inspiring to me. To my brother, if you said, "Well, this work is junk," he'd be like, "I hate you. I'm not going to do any more work." You know, <laughs> and, and some people, and it really depends on you know how do you relate. And also, I would say. There's the firm, and then there's the person in the firm. And the person in the firm is actually the most important thing. This person is going to be with you. You're, you're marrying this person. And so they're going to be with you for five, seven, ten years. And how that person acts and, and what, they're, what, what, the, what the, the, the ondas are between you and, and, and they, that's to me the most important thing. And that's why I, it's very difficult to say, well, Andreessen is number one. Um, uh, let me rephrase the, this question. Yeah. Is, there is more transactional VCs like uh, Bessemer or for giving some, some number, or more um, relationship based like uh, August Capital, yes. which is probably not so uh, famous, but yeah. I think that if this is still working in the same way, they will be more famous than other more transactional or, or tough guys. Yeah, I, you know, there, I think it's a culture. I mean, I. Look, um, I think Bessemer is an excellent fund. I work yeah. with them all the time, and uh, I, I think they're great. So, uh, and, but I, I think you, we'll, I'll have to see. I mean, remember, at the end of the day, venture capitalists, well, as you well know, venture capitalists get judged on how much money they return to their LPs. That's their business model. And this whole story of them being bad and the entrepreneurs being good is just stupid. I mean, you have to understand, their job is to put in a dollar and get out $10. And that's their job. And if you can't convince them, if you give me a dollar, I will, every dollar you give me, I will make into $10. They're not going to invest in you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.